thing to just to do. Absolutely. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of At Ron's in Laguna. I'm Ron Niles, your host, and tonight my guest is a woman who puts the hydrogen bomb test, the sad war, and the death of the king off the front page around the world, Miss Christine Jorgensen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it was pretty powerful that time. <laughs> it certainly was. It was wild. It was indeed wild, yes. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth was crowned about that time. Right, right yes. after her father died. Well, yes. yes. Well, sure, after her father, father died. Father died, of course. <laughs> He's a granddaughter, right? Yeah. Our daughter, his daughter. She well, was, I got caught on that one, didn't I? She wasn't his granddaughter. What about, it was, oh, she was Queen his Elizabeth. Queen what, Elizabeth. Well, of course, mother. No, not the mother. Wasn't the mother the queen? She was the queen when the when the king George the Sixth. But was she living. never ruled. But Elizabeth, the daughter, became queen. Right. When the father died. I see. Okay. Now the mama Elizabeth is queen mother. I'm a year the younger than you are. What are you really? Yes, I really. Oh am. God, you're 1927, aren't you? How does it feel? <laughs> yes, 1927. <laughs> Give me a break. I have a whole list of Charles Pierce and I on Cape Cod a couple of years ago. We were doing a gig up there, and Charles and I spent almost every day together, had lunch and whatever, and uh, we made a list of those born in 1926. And it's kind of interesting, I keep adding people. So I got a note from Junie Lockhart. I sent her a note, not very long ago, with a photograph that was in the register here in, in uh, Orange, County. Orange County. Register. And I, I, I call myself her favorite clipping service. Anytime I see anything about June or her daughters, I send it to her. And I said, weren't you in 1926? I got a letter back the other day. She said, no, dear, I was a 25 or I'm going to be 61. 61? And I'm going to be 60. You May, are? May of 1986. I don't know when, when you're going to show When is your birthday? 30th of May, Memorial Day. Oh, well, you're not a Taurus. No, Once I'm a... Ninth of May, you're a Gemini. I'm a Gemini. You've heard of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Uh oh dual personality. This is, is Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde and Mr. Hyde. Yes. Well, you did set the The world. two of us. Yeah. The two of you. Yeah. No, there's only one. Oh. I've known you, what, about four years now, five years? Yes, I've lived down here in Laguna since 1972. <laughs> and I <that>, love it. <laughs> the opinion of all of the articles written about you and you, there's maybe a generation gap, ladies and gentlemen, here for some of our younger audience. Yes, I know. This, some of them don't remember. We're talking about, what, 1950? December 1st, 1952, Two. the story broke. The story broke. And now, then everything went crazy for the next couple of years. Now, that was uh, actually given out by friends of the family, by kind yes. of by accident, or was it on purpose? Oh, no, they were paid for it. Oh, they were paid how nice. $300, and I didn't find out for almost 15 years who it was. Really? And when I, did, when I did find out, it hardly meant anything to me anymore because I had had such a fabulous life. Had they not done it, I wonder where I would have been. I had met all the marvelous people. Uh, you know, I'm writing a new book telling about uh, my friendship with Vivian Lee and things she said about Gone with the Wind that are absolutely incredible. Are they priceless? Priceless. And now you can do that since the Lawrence, Sir Lawrence is no longer alive and Vivian is no longer alive. Well, Lawrence is. Sir Lawrence is alive. Lawrence Olivier, he's still alive. Yes, he is. Yes, well, sir. I goofed. You are not informed. Who did it? Who was Ron? You've got to get your encyclopedia I guess I out do. and look at me. My goodness <laughs> gracious! No, Vivian was a darling, wonderful genius of a woman, fantastic. Um, in the book, how many people do you uh, talk about that are have become close friends of yours? Oh, I'm going to put a lot of them in. There's a lot of the lovely, lovely people like oh, like Dorothy Lamour, who's just a delightful lady. But I don't have anything really exciting to say about Daddy, and I don't mean it unkindly. It's because she just happens to be a lovely, delightful woman. And uh, there's no controversy or whatever. Vivian said some pretty wild things. Did she? About Gone with the Wind and, and, and making you the film and, and not even wanting to talk about it. And it's kind of interesting because Herd Hatfield, it's so strange, and I'm saying this in my book, that some people 
made absolutely classic films and didn't want to talk about them afterwards. Like Herd Hatfield? Herd Hatfield in the picture of Dorian, Dorian Gray. Gray. I said, Herd, when they were selling that portrait of you, why didn't you buy it? He said, I didn't want to hear about Dorian Gray again. And yet when the smoke clears away and Herd is gone, the classic is there. It's there. And no matter how, he was wonderful in other films, Dragon Seed, yes. Catherine Hepburn, and all the others. But the picture of Dorian Gray is what he's going to be remembered. Always. And, and then Vivian will be forgotten, forgotten with the win. wind. Even though she did win an Oscar for Streetcar, Streetcar, yes. Streetcar Named Desire. Well, she was brilliant in all of her films, but there is only one Gone with the Wind. Now, you that's true. Only one Gone with the Wind. Only one. Now, you've been an actress. Yes. Did you like acting? I liked acting. Uh, I'm not a dedicated actress. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not one of these people in, like, the Hollywood people that say I have to be on stage. Mm -hmm. Like Milton Berle. He's on stage at 30,000 feet in an airplane. I've been with him. And he's doing his whole act for the stewardess. Uh, I'm not dedicated that way, but once I commit myself to something, I don't like monkeying around on stage. I said, look, we're going to work hard and play hard, but we never play with the dialogue. When I did Oh Dad, Poor Dad, there was some, I, my son's name was Jonathan. And I never called him Jonathan. So I said to everyone, don't you ever get me to say Jonathan because it destroys what she always called him Robert and Ro Robot and any other name, but never Jonathan. And I said, if you play with the lines, all of a sudden, boom, on stage, out they come. I remember one evening in Ohio doing Oh Dad, Poor Dad. I had a 15, oh, 12, 14 minute soliloquy where I walked around the Commodore, just terrorizing him, because she was crazy. She destroyed her son, she was destroying her son, she was emasculating men, she was doing whatever she was doing. And in the middle of it, I didn't know where I was. I absolutely dried up and I had no idea who I was, what the play was, or anything. I just couldn't think of the next line. And I either, looked over right? at the Commodore sitting at the little table, and Bruce, very confident actor, looked up at me and he knew that I had absolutely dried up. And we just eye contact. He just took one look and he said, nobody was there. <laughs> nobody right was there. <laughs> and he just nodded. And he didn't, didn't smile. He just nodded and pushed me to the next blocking number. See, as I walked around the theater, this light went down and this one came up. And I was re, re, reacting to my whole life did, in this thing. Did you feel that? And I moved adrenaline? to the next moment. I moved to the next spotlight. I started the dialogue from there. And then did the unforgivable thing of trying to remember what I had left out and try to get that in while I moved to the next thing. And I, by the end of that, uh, when the house lights went down at the end of that scene, I was taken, I'm a little myopic, so they always had a young man because once the lights went out, I couldn't see anything. So they always had a young man to take me off the stage. So he'd fall off. And he took me, yeah, because I just stood absolutely still. And then he grabbed me and off the stage we went. It was theater in the round. Uh -huh. And so uh, when I got off the stage, I was absolutely in a cold sweat. I said, I don't know what I did during this scene. I really don't know what I did. Bruce came off. He said, you were marvelous. I went to the to the uh, light man, or the stage manager, I said, how did you like that performance, honey? And he said, why, was it different? He didn't even see that anything happened. And I said, I was in utter panic walking around that stage trying to be as sinister as possible and forgetting who I was. Christine, in the, in the 50s, you were doing a nightclub act. I mean, you played, oh, yeah. you played the Latin Quarter in New York. Yes, yes. You played Cuba before Havana, before yeah. it was closed. I just read the other day that that Tropicana nightclub is still open. It was the most beautiful nightclub in the world. Trees went growing right through the roof of the building. It was, and we never knew whether we were going to work outside or inside. And here I was with all this wardrobe, and I always liked to work outside because the entrance, I had to climb a stair with all this heavy wardrobe. I used to have be underdressed. Yes. I had five or six costumes on. Five at a time. With five inch heels. Five at a time. I'd climb those stairs and come out of the top of a palm tree and walk down between the palm tree on a four, a th six or eight foot wide ramp with no railing. You talk about being stupid, my dear. 
I did it. What an entrance, though. It's like being flown in on wires. Well, you just redid your, or we're doing a new act now. Yeah. Uh, you did, did it, I think, about two years ago in New York. Yes, I went to Freddy's, Freddy's in New York. New York yeah. And I read some of the reviews on it, and they were quite outstanding. Always talking about your charm and what a it's lady fun. you are. It is and fun. What a nice person. Ron, if you don't have fun, people come to nightclubs to be entertained. They come to a theater to be entertained. And my feeling is this, that if I don't entertain them, then I have failed. Uh, I, I say it in the nightclub. I said, look, leave your troubles. My opening number is Welcome to My World. Leave your troubles outside. They'll be waiting for you later. You don't need them right now. Have a moment of bliss. Uh -huh. Have a moment of contentment. Uh, I think that's what life is all about. That's why everybody's running around taking drugs and going through all this. It's all escapism. To escape from what? Life can be very wonderful. Yes, and you're in your what? I think it's your third career, they say. Uh, I have retired more times than anyone I know. Now, you're very, very well known for... Uh, um, being a lecturer, but you don't, you like to be called a what? Well, no, I, I lecture, but I, I talk to communicator. The communicator. I never say I speak, I speak with, with the students. students. I don't speak at them. You lecture at universities. Come. Yes, they're wonderful. The students are absolutely wonderful. And they're, oh, they can ask me the most direct questions. Oh, there's no hesitancy. Personal, physical questions. But I never the ones felt that they were putting me on. They want to know the answer. The answer, yes. And I think if you're lecturing, you, to the best of your ability, you must give the answers if you know them. And if I don't have the answer, I say, sorry, I don't have the answer to that question, but I'll try to find out for the next time. But and you're always truthful about it. Always. Uh, the students were, they used to bring the politicians in from Washington. I said, what are you bringing them in for? They're never going to say anything. They are absolute experts at say, speaking for an hour and saying absolutely nothing. I can come back in shock. <laughs> it's true. Did you, did you, uh, Christine, did you come from a well? family? No, uh, no, but during the Depression, if we were upper middle class, I guess we were, uh -huh. during the Depression, my, before the Depression, my father had Jorgensen Realty and Construction Company. I see. Papa always said, with my grandfather and my uncle, uh, they had one million dollars in credit in those days. That's that was a lot in 19, before 1929. So, during the Depression, Papa lost most of the houses they had built. He kept the one we lived in, where I was born, in New York. And uh, we had a car, and I never felt that I lacked any food or anything else. So I guess we were upper middle class. Well, at the time that you uh, made headlines, yes, um, that must have been extremely expensive, was it not? I mean, for, what was it, 1952, I think you said, when you started. Um, was that expensive? What do you mean expensive? Well, having surgery, going no, to Denmark, I, no, no, no. traveling I, abroad. I went, to, I went to Denmark. I was heading to Sweden. I see. And I sailed, ironically enough, on the Stockholm, the ship, and came back a couple of years later on the Andrea Doria, so, which was struck by the Stockholm. I'm not very good luck with ships. Not when I'm on them. <laughs> they break down a little bit afterward but uh sailors yes ships, i went yeah. heading for stockholm but life has opened doors to me at very odd moments i w had a one-way ticket i did not know who i was going to see i did not know where i was really going to go except stockholm because i knew they were doing research yes i got off in copenhagen and i met my cousin who's still living there and she said, I told her why I'd come to Europe, and she said, you don't have to go to soon. This was in the newspaper. She handed me a newspaper. This was in the newspaper yesterday about Dr. Hanbor. I called him, went to see him, and he said, let's try. Let's find out. No. So I met the first person I encountered or looked for, I found. Boom, boom. That Just was like incredible. That. Yes. When you think a door, a wall is up and there's no place to go, in my life, several times it's happened with that door suddenly open. So I think I've had a rather charmed life. It's, uh, it was difficult with the publicity, but still, look and at the a, life it gave. And I'm sure a lot of hurts, too. Oh, sure. But there are hurts in everyone's life. That's true. Nothing is perfect. But most people, I believe, make most of their own hurts. 
Well, you must have been very mature at 26 to make the kind of decision you made to go to do what you were going to do. I thought so at that time, but now when I look back, I realize how immature I was at 26. But I was, I was always very reserved. And so an important factor there in that period, Ron, was the fact that I had already climbed my mountain, that nothing could change that, no matter what they said. And they said, oh, she had 10,000 injections, hormone injections. Well, I wouldn't be sitting down today if I had 10,000 injections. <laughs> I mean, everything, everything was magnified out of content. Of course. And I just sat back. It was like watching a B movie, except it was about me. And Everything went crazy, and I refused to speak to the press for a long time. So they invented stories day after day after day. They'd pick up one little line. They followed me when I went to get my driver's license. Get a picture of me getting out of my car. Get a picture of me getting into my car. Who cares about me getting in and out of the car? But obviously the world did. Were you surrounded by people who protected you to some degree? My family were very protected, and my friends from before. My male friends that I was buddies with. When I got the, received the Woman of the Year Award, they surrounded me. Now that was... These were friends. That was uh, the Danish? A Scandinavian Society. Scandinavian yes. Society of New York. Yeah. And you got the Woman of the Year Award. Right. Well, that's, that is another feat in your life. Oh, there's so many things that have happened. So many people, so many things, so many moments. You, that... you did say that um, one of the things that's been very lucky for you is the door has opened for you. Several as you've times. gone through life. Several times when I felt that I was coming against a stone wall, something opened. I've been very lucky with that. Very lucky. And I, I wonder if you do it. I, I don't believe you make things happen. I do believe that. You put it in the gray matter. You say, I want to do this and I want to feel that. You may not be consciously aware of it, but you're propelling yourself into it. Even though you don't think about it, it's there. And I think that has happened so many times in my life, and I believe we all do that. It's a form of positive thinking. It's not a rah, rah, rah. Uh, you have a right to be sad. You have a right to cry. But if you overplay it, then you're destroying yourself. Nobody cares. Then, no. And then everybody backs away. Right. And they don't, why shouldn't they? Uh -huh. Why should they listen to all this nonsense? Yeah. And as I said earlier, that I think most people create their problems. They create them themselves, and then when they have to learn to live with them, they say, how did this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. You did it. You did it Even all Even if it was in the gray area. In the gray area. If you play with negative concepts, you're going to end up with a negative life. Today, in 1986, if somebody was going to do the same thing that you did almost 30 years ago, they, they give you a lot of, uh, you have to go to a psychiatrist, and they give you a lot oh, yes. of, you, yeah. for your mind. Now, you had to have done that on your own. As you said before, oh, yeah. you were not the first. But no. The, was the first that the world really knew about it publicized. The war, in fact, I, the film I made in Denmark two years ago, which I'm now trying to peddle to television here, <laughs> it's great. It really What's is. What's the title? It, it's called uh, Paradise Not for Sale. Ah. And it's a very interesting film. It's a documentary, but it brings up uh, Dr. Hirschfeld in Germany before the Second World War, who was doing research on this. And then, of course, when Hitler came to power, he was right. destroyed. And uh, much of that is in this film. I see. Anyway, uh, the concept, excuse me, was there. And But people, and I know now, let me to explain this, why I became famous. One reason only is because up to that point, there was male, there was female, and never the twain shall meet. They did not accept the basic biological fact that we are all male and female, female One biologically. Is more dominant. I, when I lecture to the students, I say, all right, you see it in your life and in your family's life. You see it, but you don't see it. I said, when grandma or your mother goes through menopause, all of a sudden she starts growing some whiskers. Her female hormones have gone down. The little male component comes right, up, comes up, and there it is. When you walk down the street and you see a flabby, little, pink-cheeked old man, 
Remember, he used to be a virile young man. Right. And so there is his male hormones, because men go through menopause too, whether That's you right. gentlemen I... like to admit it or not. <laughs> Do you have hot flashes? Like... <laughs> not anymore. I stay on my hormones. <laughs> Oh, I go into them instantly if I don't just stay on the hormones. Instantly. <laughs> well, we have to. You, we were talking about the documentary. We have to tell the people about the book you wrote. Now, you wrote this in 1967. And I love the psychological thing that you were telling. You'd mentioned, I believe, or someone did, that you had to educate the. Um, uh, the generation gap because this was in 67 yeah. and you were became famous on oh. what date? <laughs> 50 December 1st 1952. 52. So there's a lot of generation gap. Yes. And you wrote your own personalized autobiography. Yeah. That was published in 1967. Seven. And this was made into a film. 67 hardcover, 68 softcover with Bantam. Uh -huh. 69, we signed the contract and made the film, The Christine Jordan's Story, and it right. was released in 1970. Uh -huh. I had four years of my life, and I was fed up with it. Why? Do you know that I have... Well, because I was so tired... I'm tired of it. ...of That's beating the same old life. dead horse. I see. You know, life, you've got to move on. No, the they use you for technical advisor, correct, on the yes, film? Yes, I was on the film. You were on the film? I screamed and jumped up and down. <laughs> and yelled and screamed and jumped up and down. I kept saying to Edward Small, Edward, why invent a scene when the truth story is far more fascinating? But typical Hollywood, they had to invent the scenes. I see. Now, that only took it, it took your life story, well, you, from the, your starting of the book, up till you became Christine Jorgensen. No, okay. this this book, no, no, this book came up, but it didn't go into the show business aspect. That's what I meant. That's the reason the book is called The Christine Jorgensen, A Personal Autobiography. Oh, I see. Uh, because they didn't want to say, and then I made uh, this film, which I would never do a, a story on. Would you, would, would you do a sequel to this? I'm writing it now. Oh, okay, I can say it's a sequel more. to this oh, yes. that could be made into, I meant, would you make a sequel to a film also? Oh. So. Oh, I don't know. It's the things that have happened in the last 30 years. Well, that's the other half of the life that you've got. In yeah, but I wouldn't make a film. Show. I know. I'm going to talk about the people I know. I'm going to talk about the progress that has occurred in the scientific aspects of this. Uh, even the surgery. I'm hoping to get one of the top surgeons to give me photographs to put in to show the surgery. Male to female, female to male. Now tell me, what is this documentary in Europe that you are trying to get somebody to buy for PBS? Well, uh, I made it a year and a half ago. Well, in May, it'll be two years. Uh -huh. uh, it's called Paradise Not for Sale. Great title. It is a great title. It has, it's rather deep. Uh, I don't know if you saw the one that Lee, uh, Gray, uh, Lee Grant made called What Sex Am I? Oh, it's similar, yes, okay. but only this is deeper. I think it's deeper. And it goes into the history of it, going back to Magnus Hirschfeld before the Second World War. Uh, Hirschfeld not only being a Jew, but his work was very controversial. Hitler was rather crazy anyway. His full deck wasn't all there. Really? And uh, he forced Hirschfeld to leave and destroyed a lot of his papers. So we didn't know much of what was going on. Except for people who worked with Hirschfeld, they're in the film. I see. And they talk about Hirschfeld and about his work and so forth. I think it's very interesting. Very have, you, have you presented this to the different yes, uh, PBS I've gotta, stations? I've got to send it to Lee Grant because I, I sent her a copy, but it was a Danish copy of the tape, and it wouldn't play on the VCR. Oh, here. I see. I see. Okay. So now I have another copy. I want to send it to Lee Grant and her husband, uh, the producer. Now she just did that marvelous thing. On uh, television, what was it though, recently? No, you mean the What Sex Am I? Oh no, that no, was no, wonderful, that was... but she just did another one that was absolutely... Well, she does everything. I'm pulling a blank on it. Well, do you would say, so do I, I don't feel bad. It's only you remember... senility, honey, yeah. just old age <laughs> setting. Hardly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting to see Lee Grant. I mean, she's been nominated for several Oscars. I think she won one once, but... She did win. And she was blackballed during the McCarthy of era. Of course, and how many people? Gail Sinekar. Oh, who won an Oscar also. 
so was she blackballed. Was Larry Tuck. Parks. Yes. And Betty Garrett. Yeah. I mean, well, Betty was ba ba banned because of, of Larry. Larry. Uh, it was uh, a terrible era. Yes, it and was. And Gal Sinegal, who was Danish. Yes. We always spoke Danish together. I always together. think of her as Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the original Spider Woman. Yes, that was the original the, uh, Spider Woman. That was the, uh, what, uh, Sherlock Holmes, wasn't it? I think it was. Yeah. Yes, it surely was. You know, she was a marvelous film. actress. You told me that you um, went to see Elizabeth Taylor in, yeah, in, in New York. Yes, in The what? Little Foxes. Little Foxes. And tell me, you, tell the audience about the experience that you had in the well, theater. Of we were watching period. Elizabeth, who was absolutely marvelous in it, and probably one of the most beautiful creatures in the world. Really? No one should be allowed to be that beautiful, really. She, and she's a delightful lady. Anyway, in during the intermission, I opened the program, and I suddenly realized this was the theater that I had seen my first play in, I'd have to find the date, the early 40s, or maybe in late 30s, and it was Catherine Cornell and Brian Ahern in the Barretts of Wimble Street, in this same theater. And we were the students, so we had the seats way, way, way up high. The very last so, seats, right? The very last, very, I was sitting in the very last row. I don't know exactly which seat, but it was the last row. So when I went back to Elizabeth's dressing room, and also to see Maureen Stapleton, uh -huh. dear, wonderful Maureen Stapleton. Wonderful talent. Uh, I had across the stage, the asbestos curtain was up, and the one proverbial theater light was on, and I stopped in the middle of the stage, and I looked up, and I said, in that top row somewhere, one of those seats, I sat to see Catherine Cornell and Brian Ahern in the Barracks of Wimpole Street. And you had been there. I had been there, you and I didn't realize there. it was the same theater. Did you have a deja vu? Well, I had a very definite deja vu. Very definite deja vu. I thought, this is the same theater. So I didn't realize what theater it had been and, uh, until I read the program. And I said, I've been here before, many years. As a little student, As a little student. with you, a little cheapy ticket. <laughs> do you have any inkling, inkling of what the film is going to be like that Vanessa Redgrave is doing on the Renee Richards story? Which is I, actually local because it's Newport Beach, right? I don't think Renee Richards lives in Newport Beach anymore. Not anymore? I don't think so. I really don't know where. I think she has disassociated herself from the whole thing. The whole thing? Because she was uh, got to be very good in tennis. Yes. She wanted to turn pro. Yeah. Well, of course, that was a difficult period because who knows how long she was off the male hormones before she was competing as a female. Oh, I see. Was that and male the problem hormones there? create the muscles. Was that the problem there? I think that was part of it. Part of what it was. Uh, and then, of course, just when the whole thing came to a head, little Tracy Austin beat her. Yes, okay. So, well, was course, she 16? If Tracy that. Austin was 14, 14 or something. Well, yes. Renee Richards wasn't that young anymore either. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the film. Uh, I think it's called Second Serve. Oh, it is? And of course, yeah. Okay. That's the name. That's of, going to be that the... was the name of her book. I haven't read her book. I have never seen Renee Richards' book. But uh, I, anything Vanessa Redgrave, with all due respect to her political feelings, she's still a brilliant, fabulous actress. Yes, she is. And I'm sure she will do a fantastic job in it. And I still feel the same way. She uh, Maybe she spouts too much. But I was asked many years ago, I remember during the Elizabeth Taylor Burton thing. Uh-huh. You know, with, she was married to Eddie Fisher, Eddie Fisher time, right. and all this business. And they said, well, what do you think? I said, I think only one thing. Miss Taylor owes me the best performance she can give. If she gives me less than that, I have a right to criticize her. Her personal life is none of my business. That's true. And she always said she always married everybody she ever went with. That's a, honey, that's her privilege. She, she, pay, she paid with the heart. Well, well, she goes all over the world. I know. it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week. I want to thank Christine Jorgensen my very special guest. Join us next week for another edition of At Ron's in Laguna. I'm Ron now as your host. Good night. We'll see you next week. Good night. Bye-bye. Arrivederci.